Santiago de Chile. The capital of Chile is dignified, modest and European looking and also lively, modern and full of Latin temperaments. A city that has many green areas and a history that covers 500 years. The Plaza de Armas is the heart of the city. The historic center of colonial Santiago that contains the city's most important buildings. The Intendencia, the city's administrative offices, fine residences and the cathedral. And in the middle, a park with huge palm trees. Here, the elderly chat and read newspapers while the young flirt and children take their first steps. A calm scene. And the city's founder, looking both noble and stern, observes all this from his equestrian statue. A low-lying building is one of the oldest in the city, the Casa Colorada, with a red brick facade, first floor balconies and a tranquil inner courtyard. A rich merchant, who subsequently became president, built this impressive colonial building in 1769. At that time, the height of luxury. The ground floor contained spacious offices, and the family lived on the upper floor. Today, it is the city's history museum. The main post office is a white building with abundant adornments and looks like a palace. Its interior is quite splendid and reflects a time when the postal service was well respected and free from competition. At the end of the 19th century, the Correo Central was built in neo-baroque design on the foundation of the governor's palace along the Plaza de Armas. Tall wooden desks, a checkered ceramic floor, wooden counters with milky looking windows and all illuminated by chandeliers. The Museo Histórico Nacional is also situated on the Plaza de Armas and is located in the Palacio Real Audiencia. Around 12,000 exhibits are displayed here, featuring Chile's history from pre-Columbian times right up to the 20th century. Nineteenth-century portrait painting, arts and crafts, furniture and carriages recall the life of bygone times. Cultural treasures of national history, from military nobility to the everyday life of the upper classes. The rooms in which once supreme justice was handed out today feature various collections. On the northern side of the plaza is the impressive cathedral whose facade was designed in 1780 by Joachim Toesca. It has been destroyed by earthquakes three times, each time having been rebuilt. So it contains a combination of Baroque and neoclassical design.
At the time of the city's foundation, a small chapel was located here. It was later destroyed by the Mapuche Indians. The huge main hall is dimly lit, which creates a mystic atmosphere. And silence is all-pervading. In 1899, the interior saw much transformation. The wainscoting of carved and gilded cedar wood was replaced by various stucco and gypsum ornaments. The interior is an overwhelming sight, one clearly intended by the church dignitaries to overawe. The palace features a history of art. The former custom house contains the Museum of Pre-Columbian Art, with around 4,500 exhibits from Latin America. Including numerous works of art of the Tuca, Aztec and Mapuche Indians that date back thousands of years. A special room is dedicated to the death cult of the Mapuche Indians, a tribe from Argentina that once populated Chile. They mummified their dead. But in contrast to the Nazca culture, not in a seated but in a prone position. Selected works of art from the continent's oldest ceramic culture are also on show. With surprisingly modern looking designs. This splendid white building and its impressive portal is known as the Congreso Nacional although today the Congress meets in Valparaiso. It was built in classical style in 1901 and is surrounded by a fine garden. Today it has two conference halls and a library. In former times, a church once stood here, but in 1863, it burnt down tragically, killing 2,000 people. The city of Valparaiso, or Paradise Valley, is around 120 kilometers from the capital of Santiago de Chile, on the Pacific coast. The most important harbour city in South America has a long history. Today it boasts a modern, ever-expanding container harbour. Indeed, with the upgrading of its harbours, Chile is hoping to become the most important trans-shipping centre in Latin America. The city's development was, from the beginning, closely connected with its harbour. and the heroes of the Saltpeter War brought wealth and power. The main district of the Chilean Navy was once the seat of the province's governor, and later the summer residence of the president. Since the middle of the 19th century, escalators have rattled up and down the steep hills of the harbour city. 45 hills flank the bay and each of them is covered with a number of tiny wooden huts. Here, an efficient means of transport is essential. The cabins are pulled along steep rails. The city's golden age lasted for only a hundred years. In 1906, an earthquake devastated the city and 6,000 people died in the ruins. 
But the people persevered, rebuilt their houses, fishermen returned to work, and the trading companies set about developing new business ideas. There were once 29 escalators, but today only 15 are still in operation. This old city on the sea was once the Pearl of the Pacific. Returning to Santiago, we visit the city centre and the pedestrian area of Pasio Ahumada, where there's a constant flow of people. This vital lifeline between banks and shops demonstrates the very best of metropolitan flair. Strikingly dressed in black and white uniforms and brown caps, the soldiers of the guard march across the Plaza de la Constitución towards the La Moneda Palace. An elongated, strictly classical building whose white facade looks almost kitsch with the blue sky as its backdrop. It also was designed by Joaquin Toesca. In the 18th century, it was the biggest building that the Spanish crown had built in Hispano-America, low and wide to protect against earthquakes. From the beginning, coins were manufactured in the palace, and it was thus named accordingly. It was inaugurated in 1805, and for 41 years, coins were manufactured amid strict security. Indeed, the president came to live here. But La Moneda was also the setting of many dramatic events during the military push of 1973, when Salvador Allende died here. Following restoration work, General Augusto Pinochet moved in and it has been the seat of government ever since. Dictatorship transformed into democracy. A small adjoining chapel is a reminder of newfound humanity and liberty. The Barrio Paris Londres district features noble buildings that date back to the 1920s. Unlike the relative uniformity of the main part of the city, this area contains a number of winding streets. The striking and imaginative architecture is in stark contrast to the modern architecture that dominates the rest of the city. Decorated facades and playful architecture are evocative of the glories of past times. The San Francisco Church is the oldest church in Chile. The country's first chapel was built here. It has survived various earthquakes and its modest red walls and tower are among the city's most well-known landmarks. The friars of the Franciscan order came to Santiago in 1549 and built a monastery some distance from the city. The city's founder stored a real treasure here that still adorns the high altar, a statue of the Virgin del Socorro.
This statue of the Virgin Mary originally came from Europe and accompanied him on his many journeys and military campaigns, until it became the city's patron saint. The 70-meter-high Giro Santa Lucia Hill in the city center is the place where it all began. Here in 1541, Pedro de Valdivier laid the foundation stone for a settlement that he named Santiago del Nuevo Estremo. Monumental steps lead to a baroque labyrinth of rotundas, monuments, pathways, gardens, fountains and squares. On this hill, 150 men pitched camp. In despair, the Mapuche named it Pain. Today, it's a leisure paradise for the local people and is very popular, especially in Eden. The Spanish conquerors and missionaries introduced the first vines and today Chilean wine is appreciated all over the world. The surroundings of Santiago feature historic vine growing estates that have managed to survive the centuries and now produce wine using modern methods. Chilean wine is much respected. Here the earth is rich in minerals and hot days and cool nights as well as mist from the Pacific Ocean favor the growth of the vines. At the end of the 19th century, vine fretter caused much devastation to the vineyards of Europe. But Chile was spared and its vine survived. In the evening we return to the city. The streets are still busy. And the illuminated skyscrapers look similar to those anywhere else in the world. Now the nightlife begins with the Bally High Show. Traditional Chilean folk dance at a good dinner. An evening of entertainment that features various of the country's regions. Grass skirts rustle and wild rhythms sound out, reminiscent of Easter Island that was settled from Polynesia. As Easter Island belongs to Chile, these rhythms and dances are also part of the Chilean culture. The Mercado Municipal was built in 1872 for another purpose. At first, it was meant to serve as an exhibition hall for local artists. Its iron construction was manufactured in England and assembled here. Iron and glass, a striking roof structure. But soon after its completion, the artists were forced to look for an alternative building when local merchants wanted to trade here. Today, visitors are attracted by various restaurants. You can shop for anything from jewelry to fish. And it's also a good place for a leisurely stroll and a friendly chat. The Parque Forestal is situated on the northern edge of the city centre, along the Rio Mapocho. A European-like park complex with various varieties of tree.
Amid all the green is the German fountain with at its center a ship with heroic figures and huge birds of prey. Large parks are scattered throughout the city and help to make it comfortable despite the heat. Blossoming bushes are a fine sight. The Providentia district is one of the city's most modern areas with several new skyscrapers that contain offices and apartments. This is where, in 1853, the nuns of the Order of the Hermanas de Providentia settled due to the tranquility and remoteness of the area. Postmodern glass palaces extend in all directions. This city at the foot of the snow-covered Andes has become an economic miracle. In the Bella Vista district, a work of art lies hidden at the end of a small alley. Here, famous author Pablo Neruda created an extraordinary love den that now has a cult following and can be visited as a museum. Neruda, who was known for his romantic poems, was a consul and represented Chile in many countries. He gave his mistress a fine house. As with his other properties, this is a mishmash of kitsch as well as art from all over the world, collected on his many travels. Neruda liked bars. He had three here. Actually, there are three buildings that lie in steps above each other, built on a hill, with a fine view of the city. The poet of the revolution found his paradise here. A little further on is the castle-like valley station of the Funicular, a cable car that travels the Caro San Cristobal. The city's second highest mountain is a popular leisure area. A huge, shining white statue of the Virgin Mary crowns its summit. She extends her arms to protect the city. On clear days, the view from here is spectacular, with the snow-covered summits of the Andes in the background and a sea of houses that merge with the skyscrapers of the city. A city that has often suffered devastating earthquakes and terrifying fires. Today the buildings that date back to colonial days hide between those of contemporary times. The city is looking good. And although with colonial roots, Santiago de Chile is now open-minded, modern and cosmopolitan.